So uh, Rebecca and I, uh, we operate Fair Share Farm. Um, this is the farm. We're in northeast Clay County, Missouri, north Kansas City. So that's our house. We got a barn, our new fermenting facility, a high tunnel, two different fields that we operate. One we tend to use more in the spring uh, when because it, it dries out quicker. We have an irrigation pond here and a solar panel. The irrigation system is solar powered. We started in 2003 and um, first CSA season was 2004. This year we had 130 members. Our members work on the farm. That's part of the um, CSA operation. Rebecca's a fourth generation farmer. Uh, we also have some hens at this point. And um, so this is our CSA. Like I said, we're a participatory CSA. That's kind of the traditional model. Our members are required to help uh, two to three times a year to come out with the harvest. Um, it's one of the things in our survey, they say they actually like it, um, almost the most about the farm. We grow 40 different types of vegetables like most CSA farms. Uh, our approach, um, we're not certified organic and we consider ourselves a biological farm. You know, we tell people that what we do is so we think of the soil as the plant's stomach. You know, um, you're going to feed the soil. You grow a cover crop, you turn it under. The biology of the soil digests and decomposes that matter, and that's what you feed the plant with. Just like yourself. You eat a piece of broccoli, it goes into your body. It gets um, digested by the, um, by the probiotics in your body. And we also like to say you are what you eat, so you are what your plants eat. And we feel all the cover cropping and biological methods that we've used over the years really helps improve the nutrition and the flavor of the crops. Um, we do it, we feed the soil a balanced meal. We try every year to either give us cover crops, compost, or a hay mulch, uh, straw, or organic fertilizer, and we cover crop pretty much all year long. So we do a lot of mulching. We buy compost. There's an organization called Missouri Organics in Kansas City. We can get, um, that's enough for about 20 beds of, uh, 20,000 foot beds, about half acre. We use a Fertrell a Super N as an a, um, organic fertilizer that we can apply. It's easy to put down. We uh, have a, one, we actually now have two movable uh, hen houses. We like to move them into areas where we have cover crops growing and ha have them uh, use that as a food source as well as their ration. As I said, we grow a lot of cover crops. This is crotalaria and, sun and um, sorghum sedan grass here, buckwheat. We have an electric tractor. So it's an Alice Chalmers G. There's a Sarah Grant from a while back that um, uh, from a farmer in uh, New York State, Ron Colsa, he converted it to, uh, from gas to electric. You can see the batteries on the back there. It essentially runs like a golf cart. Um, this was our field day that we had uh, this year. So another thing, like I said, we've been farming 13 years using biological practices. Um, last year I decided to compile all of our uh, soil data. So back in 2003, we actually got a grant from the state of Missouri, a Sustainable Ag Demonstration Award. Joan's familiar with that. She signed off on that. Um, and we were able to get money for soil testing. We got a, a manure spreader um, and money to buy cover crop seeds. And so that kind of got us starting, started. And just want to kind of point out here, you know, the, the whole point of organic or biological farming is to improve soil quality. If you do that, then the plants are going to grow. So um, we have this first sample. There's only one. I don't think it, it's really uh, is a baseline as much as this. So we started out with about 2.6% organic matter on our farm. Um, and for a while, every year, and then we skipped and we, we just kept taking soil samples. And you can see as time went on here, we went from our ranges being less than three in the twos 
to where we get down here towards 2013, 15, our ranges have gone up. So you can see we've basically raised our soil organic matter by almost uh, uh, one and a half percent. And that's one thing that we're really proud of. And we like to show this, this is in a graph, that this is what organic farming can do. I don't think it's talked about enough. If you look at from like 2008 until now, um, with the acreage that we've grown, we've calculated that we've added about 250,000 pounds of organic matter to our soil, which relates to about 350,000 pounds of carbon dioxide that we've sequestered. So that's something that is, in agriculture, you can do just kind of a matter of course. And we think that's important. You can see that it kind of bounced around and went down and then up. Um, for a while, we were, took a while, a lot of years for us to really get our cover cropping going, but once we did, you can see the improvements. So, uh, like I said, the, the biology of the soil is important, and we've always kind of wanted to do value added, but didn't really want to slave over a stove and make tomato sauce for people. Um, and what we've decided to do is to do fermenting. So, um, we like how that kind of ties the biology of the soil, to the biology of the food, to the biology of, your, of our digestive systems, because they're all really the same thing. Um, so sauerkraut's obviously one fermented food most people are familiar with. Um, here's Rebecca, it's a little blurry, filling some jars with kimchi in our new kitchen. And there's a facility uh, built on like a 100-year-old tobacco barn. And um, those are a couple of our products. So that was part of the genesis for this project. Uh, we do grow some things that are more fruiting uh, vegetables, like cucumbers to make pickles and jalapenos to make pickled jalapenos. But the idea was we're going to grow a lot of cabbage. So we want to do it the simplest way possible, least amount of labor. And so the roll roller crimper and planting into rolled down beds is something that we wanted to um, work on. So it's been uh, quite a long project. Um, so you see here 2013. First step was to plant rye vetch in the winter or in the fall so that the following spring we'd have a crop to roll down. Um, the idea was that we would uh, so crimp these down. We also trialing tomatoes in uh, rolled down cover crops. And then in July, late July, plant the fall brassicas into, into that. And then in September, seed the rye vetch for the next year. Um, so we'll go through all that. So 2014, no-till brassica. You can see here, this is a um, flail mower that we had. And uh, part of the project also was to get us a, a, a better flail mower that one's a little lightweight. There weren't a lot of safety guards on it. Um, but one thing it did show is that uh, in talking to Ron Morse also, who's our technical advisor, um, Dr. Morse is from Virginia Tech. So you don't need to buy a roller crimper. We had that in there originally and then we took it out. Um, to roll down a cover crop, the, the flail mowers have a very, very large roller on the back of them, very, very heavy. So all you really need to do is to drag the flail mower through a bed without the mower going to roll down the crops. And this is what it looks like. So 2014 all started out really well. We had a really nice rye vetch crop. Um, we rolled it down. It looked like this. It looked really good. Um, the vetch came back up, which isn't unusual. It's more viney. It doesn't really have the stem like rye does. It'll just break. Uh, we mowed that off. Well, at the same time, we were doing a trial, so we, we did the roll down beds, and then we used our spader and we tilled in beds. And the idea was to compare roll down production versus um, tilled production. Mowed off the rye vetch. But then, as you can see behind our farm crew here, the bindweed started coming in. We had other areas where the grasses started coming in. So, you know, we were trying, sent these guys out here, I think it was maybe 
75 foot? I don't know if it was even that far. And it's like, okay, let's just see how long it's going to take. So it took like five hours of personnel time to hand weed this area, and then it just came back anyway. So we tried another thing. We had this um, organic herbicide called Ground Force, which is um, it's just like a citric or acetic acid. And so we tried spraying that, and then we sprayed the whole thing, and it didn't matter. It just all came back. It's not a systemic herbicide. It just kind of kills the top growth. So the main focus of this whole project, the first year, we just had to abandon the thought of even planting into this. We did, I'll show you with the no-till planting aid, we did try to um, um, run the machinery, but we didn't plant into it. So no-till planting aid, uh, it's basically a, a furrower, and it's a system that Dr. Morse um, developed. And so he helped us in building the no-till planting aid. So it's a way to just pull furrows in the rolled down cover crop and then you can plant into that area. So you can just uh, look, he has um, a lot of literature on this. You know, you can go online, you can buy a toolbar, you can buy this and that and you just kind of build it. But we had this equipment laying around the farm so it was like, well, we're going to kind of farm hack the whole thing. So we had this toolbar which Looks like it's a square toolbar, and after I bought the clamps, found out it's actually a diamond toolbar. And then these shanks, you know, one's longer than the other. He was saying these coulters, they were really too small to use. Um, so I kind of roughed it up. So these are, one of the things we bought were these coulters. You really need them to be big if you have uh, a lot of um, roll down cover crop. It has to be able to cut through it. Uh, this shank wasn't going to, there just wasn't enough space there. Um, so we really, we had to get a piece of uh, steel and drop this straight down. And then it turned out that they're still kind of too close. We had a bolt and extension onto that. You can kind of see where this is a square on a diamond. And then you got this little bit here, and we had uh, we didn't cut that off the first year, so it worked. It worked well, just like he said it would. It dragged through. You just had a furrow going there. We have a water wheel transplanter. The idea was we'd space the water wheels at that distance and pull it through and be able to plant. But I've shown you those pictures before. You can see that already all this vine weed had grown back in. Um, so last year we couldn't do it, I'll go into that. This year I kind of fixed it up a little bit. You can see here I cut that off. That was really catching on the cover crop and, and causing a problem. And you can see here the steel that's the extension. We spent money and bought a diamond clamp. So um, it worked, worked really well. Pulls right through there. You can kind of see it. It cuts down maybe eight inches into the soil. And um, so the no-till planting aid worked fine. Our, our you know, conclusions are you can farm hack it and maybe save a little bit of money, or it's not that hard to find the parts you need for a toolbar and everything else to, to make it um, with new parts. It's a great tool. It does what it says. And we still may use it. Um, there may be times when it's really wet out and we don't want to till an area and we can use this to, to create a planting furrow without um, causing a lot of problems. So this is Rebecca. This is one of our other field days. We had a field day each year. That same year, 2014, we um, did the same thing for tomatoes. So the idea with the tomatoes, we only in the summer, we do a second planting of tomatoes, and they're, we call them our summer tomatoes. We use a hybrid, we'll cage them. And um, so we took this 200 foot bed, that's our standard bed length, and rolled down 100 foot of it, and then the other 100 feet we spaded in and planted into that to mulch. Um, here's the tomatoes that we hand planted in here. Unfortunately, we, uh, I, I, uh, I'm still searching for the data from this one, but it was really wet 
I mean, when we dug the holes and put these tomato plants in, there was water at the bottom. It was, it was a really wet year, so I don't know that the data from this necessarily would have been that good. And we did the same test this year, and I have much better information um, from that. But you can kind of see, it. Uh, we did hand weed this once. And for the tomatoes, it didn't work out too bad. The thing with the tomatoes are that you, you roll it down. Most of this happens in late May. That's when the rye um, has reached the stage where you're going to crimp it down. And the tomatoes, our summer tomatoes, will plant maybe second week, week of June. So it will have died back and we can plant right into it. Whereas with the brassicas, you roll it down, you know, before May's over and then you're not going to plant until the middle of July your cabbage or something and it just sitting there all this time and weeds have more of a chance to grow. Just wanted to go through this real quick just to kind of show you uh, we've done a lot of, a lot of cover cropping. Um, this is an example we do cover crops in the spring, summer, and fall. This is like a summer cover crop of uh, um, looks like uh, mung bean or, or um, uh, uh, beans and, and uh, sorghum sedan grass. So we'll let it grow. Um, we'll flail mow it down. That's what it looks like when it flail mows. It's all nice and chopped. And then this is our spader. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a spader. It's one of the first pieces of equipment that we got. They had one at the farm in New York where we were. Um, it, uh, it's a really nice piece of equipment. You can see these shovels in here. So there's like a half dozen shovels and they actually dig the soil. You can actually go through a bed, say you had potatoes in and you harvested them all and go through and spade and you can find potatoes that are, you know, haven't even been damaged when you're all done spading. So it's, uh, it's not as pulverizing as a garden type tiller. That's what it looks like on a, on a good day. We have um, silk clay soil, so it's really difficult to always find the exact perfect soil moisture to, to spade, but that looks nice like that. You know, we consider cover cropping kind of composting in place. We also have, in the past, have taken the plastic off our high tunnel and cover cropped our high tunnel. So 2015, um, was going to be our second year. It's going to be a two-year project, but uh, we suspended the project because of uh, rain. So I don't know if you can read all this data, but you can see down here at the bottom. It was a, I don't. It was the first year I ever decided to keep like rainfall records. I just had a little log, and I kept the notes, and uh, it was really interesting to have done it this year. Over the course of 74 days, we had almost. 36 inches of rain, which equates to almost a half an inch of rain every day for 74 days. Uh, right in here, this is about the time that you would normally um, be rolling and crimping. And up till the end of May, we had 10 inches. And then the first week of June, we had 10 inches just in, in those couple days. Um, we also had hail. So this you can kind of see, this is um, total precipitation for that day and we're right in the middle of the worst of it. So this is what strawberries look like after they've been pummeled by um, hail. Like Rebecca said, it looks like little tiny fairy punches on them. And, and uh, when you count on your strawberries and they're just ripening and you get hail, it's no fun. And so we're trying to keep the project going too. Um, but like you can see, there was really no time period when this was ready to be rolled down that we could get in there. And I was doing everything I could to work on this project and keep the rest of the farm going. And uh, there are a few times when I probably went out, went out there when I shouldn't have. So um, that was a lesson all in and of itself. This is more of the, the rain that we had. So we skipped 2015 um, and got into 2016. So one of the other parts of this project was to evaluate our cover cropping method. We had always just done um, broadcast seeding 
and harrowing. So that's how we would do our uh, cover cropping. And you've seen some, some of those pictures, things worked out fine, but it's pretty labor intensive. Um, so the idea was to get a cedar and I spent almost two years looking for a used grain drill, like six foot wide. And I had absolutely no luck finding one. So eventually decided to go to getting a um, vegetable cedar. So our Alice Chalmers G, we have a toolbar and we have uh, three Planet Junior cedars and um, we can seed with that just off the electric tractor. So the thought was if I can get four new uh, Planet Juniors, I could put that on the Alice um, Chalmers and we could use our electric tractor to do our cover cropping. But uh, turns out once the cedars came that these are newer ones and they're like twice the weight of the other ones. So um, that didn't really work out. So we had to get a toolbar so that we could just pull it behind our, um, our farm mall. So these are vegetable cedars. And we we're trying to seed cover crops, but you know, for the most part, seeds are seeds. So we started looking at, well, you know, what's the seed plate for rye or vetch or whatever. And so one way to do it was simply to measure the circumference of the front wheel, which would be the ground tracking on it, um, open up the cedar, and just spin the wheel for so many feet and count how many pounds fell out. And then we could calculate, okay, well, this wheel will get you so many pounds per acre or per bed, whatever we wanted. So I did that and every, like this hopper, it looks like these both had like vetch in them and those two might have had rye. Um, these were offset, so we wanted eight rows, so I had to kind of turn around and go back down the other way and try and have the cedar go in between the other rows. Um, so that didn't work out all that great. It worked out okay. And then the other thing was having two different seeds and two different seed holes and trying to keep all that perfect really was kind of a pain. So I went to just um, mixing the seed and you just use the largest seed hole and you calibrate it that way. So you mix the rye and vetch or the oats and peas or the Sudan grass and crotillaria together, whatever it is you need, and you find the seed where you get, um, we we're trying to get about about two pounds or so per thousand foot bed. So the, you can see here, oh, we got one, two, three, four, five, like six rows here. This is a bed. So and you really want like eight. So it wasn't too bad. Um, it grew pretty well. The, the peas were supposed to be separate inside there and some of those worked, some didn't. So for the next time I did it, I tried putting it all to one side, figuring at least I'd make sure everything was on one side or on each side. Um, this was this summer and uh, some of that didn't turn out that well because it got very dry for a while and the seeds just sat there and so the weeds started to take over. But this is part of the trial where this area here was broadcast and harrow it in, and these were with the cedar. And it pretty much looked like that. We'd cut areas and weigh them. And so we did this two different times. And so you can see from the top one, the first time we did it in a spring crop, the cedar had a little bit better weight. And then when we measured in the fall for one of the summer plantings, the broadcast had a better weight. We took like a four by four area, just cut it down and weighed it. We kept using it. It does, the cedar, it does give you a pretty good uh, stand. It doesn't always look like it at the start. These are peas and oats. And this is just interesting, it's so warm. This year, this is actually a sun hemp flower, which we've never seen before because just been growing all year, all winter long or, or uh, fall long. So we feel the vegetable cedar can be used to seed cover crops. Um, it's a multi-use cedar then if you have more than one um, use for it, if you're a vegetable farmer. We would advise combining two seed types into the, and use the larger cedar hole, the one for the larger seed. 
Uh, and then you can just have all your cedars at the same cedar hole. We had it a little difficult to get like eight perfectly spaced rows. Um, and harrowing can be just as effective as the cedar. It just takes a lot more effort. So this is our second try at the no-till brassica. That was this, this is this year. So last September, we put down rye vetch. That was that really, really wet year. And for some reason, you can see there's hardly any rye that came up, but we had a lot of vetch. So that's what it looked like in May. We rolled down the vetch. We, um, that's a picture of the new flail mower. You can kind of see that roller there. That just helps roll stuff down. Uh, and this is one of the trial beds. And pretty much the same thing happened. Um, you know, the, where we are, I mean, all out here, it's a lot of grassland. And like between the end of May and then you have all of June and going into July, that's when grasses really, really want to grow. This area, we'd never put down hay or anything. It was a relatively new area that we were, um, it's like the second year we used it. But when you have to wait around that long before you plant, at least for us, you just get too much weed pressure, especially from the grasses. So um, it's easy to roll down with the flail mower. There's a problem because of the weed pressure from the gr grasses in the heat of the summer. You saw the wet periods we had. It's really hard to implement the roller crimper and planting in it during the wet periods. And we tried doing like hand weeding and everything and that really is not an effective way to kind of make up for any, any problems that you might have. This is more rain. So this year at the end of August we had 10 inches over a couple days and four inches a couple weeks later. So there was still a lot of this this year. Um, so these are the summer tomatoes. So this is the same thing as I was showing you before. We grew a cover crop. One area we uh, mowed it and spaded it in. The other one we rolled it. This is what it looked like right after we were done with that. You can see there's hay on the left. We, we mainly use hay. We're able to get hay off of Rebecca's family land next door. The one on the right is the rolled down vetch. So things started out pretty good, both of them. These are um, Bellarosa, I believe, or the tomato type, they're a summer tomato. This is once they really started going. Um, I don't know if you can really tell, but this, the, the hay mulched ones were really um, a deeper green. They're a better stand than over here. We weeded these once, but after that it was like, well, they're kind of on their own. That's the point. We don't want to be spending a lot of time weeding. What kind of hay was that? Um, was it native grass hay? Or no. It's like, what type of, the question was what, hay. Yeah, that's okay. yeah, what type of hay? And it, it was um, like a lot of brome. There was some clover in there, um, but yeah, it wasn't native. Um, we may be able to get native soon. Her father just um, seeded a lot of switchgrass all over the farm. So maybe in the future. So this year we had a lot of, you know, the fruit was really great. Um, there was a problem uh, when they, we first started going out to harvest. Our irrigation had kind of, um, we had some complications with it for a while. And the kind of the first fruits that we were picking had a lot of blossom end rot. Um, got the irrigation working, we watered a lot, and that kind of went away. And this is the data from this year. So you can see here that ones with the hay mulch had three times the um, yield that the um, rolled ones did. Um, they both had a decent amount of fruit set, but the, the hay mulched ones had had a lot more first. This is mainly first, at least first trying to come off the field. So both of the roller crimper, like I said, they keep down the weeds because you're going to plant in them right, pretty much right away. So it's a much better situation. We are maybe considering trying this for the summer tomatoes a different year and then 
mulching the rolled down areas right away. And that might really eliminate weeds and maybe then the um, rolled down crops will get a little more digested. You know, all that top growth, if you don't spade it in, it doesn't really get digested and you don't get as much nutrient release. So part of it is there just wasn't as much in the soil. But the um, spaded and hay mulch beds, if you can get a good spading, seem to work as well as anything. So these are some of the costs. So the no-till planting aid, with us you already having a toolbar and a few things, was about 1100 bucks. The flail mower I was able to um, find online. I actually came out here to Kansas somewhere to pick it up. And then uh, the coal cedar with uh, the hitch was a little over $4,000. So. Sorry, there's not more data about what we planted, but it did demonstrate to us that uh, um, it, you know, we tried and tried. It's not necessarily a system that's going to work in our area, in our soils, uh, for us. Did you ever get rid of the bindweed? No. No, well, it's funny, the wet year, we hardly saw any bindweed on the farm. And um, we didn't really have as much this year as we had two years ago when, when I was showing you that. We um, applied, Rebecca applied for a permit from USDA to buy these bindweed mites. Have you heard about them at all? No. So there's supposedly there are these mites that only attack bindweed. And somewhere out in Colorado, you can buy them. So she had to like go through this whole process, and you know, it's like if you know, same type of paperwork if you're going to transfer smallpox across state lines, you know. And uh, so she applied for it, and we were going to do it the next year, but because of all the rain, we didn't do it. Yeah, well, I had a bindweed problem, and uh, cattle worked wonderful. Yeah, I mean, they cleaned it out. Hmm. My only concern was were they going to carry seed elsewhere, mm -hmm. but they digest the seed. Hmm. Uh -huh. uh, I had no spreading. So <laughs> haying it would be an option if you can find somebody that's willing to buy hay with bindweed in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're hoping maybe the chickens might do something to it too, but um, we don't know yet. Have you guys ever tried anything with like on your cover crop having an edible mixed in with the cover crop? For us? Like, yeah. like as a cash crop? Mm -hmm. No. Well, I guess I shouldn't say that. We um, kind of, we're growing daikons. So we eat tillage radishes and we're doing the fermenting. And right now we're kind of trialing the, um, there's some varieties from Johnny and other places that are really more culinary. And I've tried the the tillage radishes, um, but right now the batch that we did is really has a lot of bitterness to it. And I suppose if we, I mean, if you plant a whole bed of them, you can just pull up, you know, 100 pounds and you're not going to lose a lot. But the whole idea of the tillage radish is to leave it in the ground. And then otherwise we don't have a combine, you know. If we did, we'd probably get a lot of buckwheat because buckwheat, like, seeds, you know, almost right away.